How you doing, Wade? Ah, uh, reasonably okay. We're having some technical difficulties because of infernal machines, but you know, sometimes it do be like that. Yep, I agree with you on that, brother. And sometimes there are things that want to silence the truth. But he, we here at Magic.tv don't believe in silencing the truth to, from anyone. We really just want to educate and bring people to the forefront of what's really going on in a magical practice. The and thing no is, you can't really silence the truth. If something's yeah. true, it's true for everybody. So you, you can delay it. That's all you can do. True. And you know something, brother? I'm sad. I'm actually sad today. Because a travesty happened in the occult world. One of the most compassionate, the most passionate, and respectable authors of today found himself as a, as a victim of unjust deplatforming. And it was none other than our dear friend Shea Belay. Did you know that? Did you know that Facebook decided to completely, arbitrarily, with no, with no explanation reason or even an attempt to allow him to justify himself kill his fan page and kill his personal page how do you feel about that man you know i'm i'm seeing it more and more um social media is, is such a huge part of everybody's life now of of the country of you know the whole zeitgeist is is heavily influenced by social media and you have private companies that are controlling this you know these large you know large this volume of communication and when they come out and they're they just want to silence somebody i could understand if he was doing something bad with the platform if he was you know advocating violence or crime or something like that or telling children to go steal ten dollars out of their you know mom's purse and send it to them if the, if the, if it was that that'd be one thing because we still do have to have responsible communication in the world but when you hear people talk about you know censorship about you know big tech coming down on you usually it's because somebody clearly messed up Mm -hmm. Somebody was on there like, oh, I sent my ex a death threat and Facebook canceled me for it. Oh, my God, I'm being so persecuted. It's not like that. It's there's always something. It's a conscious decision because they're losing viewers on their site. So they had they had to make this decision for a reason. But sure. if they don't give you that reason, how are you supposed to correct yourself? It's donkey shit. That's exactly what it is. It's arbitrary muzzling of somebody who's simply representing his freedom of speech. And I'm imploring every single one out there watching magic.tv today and any day in the future. If you want to fight this, of course, we can't beat Facebook because they own all the algorithms. But there are other ways we can fight this. Number one, we support our brother Shea Belay by buying his book. Number one, by following him on Instagram, by telling him, hey, we love your work. We love your truth, your passion. You're not a violent person, even though you're a fighter. You're a person who actually shows the beautiful side of what you're doing. And I'm sure, because I'm sure it broke his heart. I mean, anybody would be heartbroken to be deep platform like that. So I actually... Well, wait a second. Huh? Facebook owns Instagram. That's the weird thing, man. That's the fucking weird thing, bro. That they actually... They actually... Allowed him on Instagram, but on Facebook, none. Not at all. So I'm putting his Instagram uh, here on on the, on the page so you guys can see him on the show. Uh, okay. it's, right it's under Instagram, Shea Belay. But is, he on, is he on Twitter? It, I, I don't know if he has a Twitter because that's actually where I met him. But, you know, we both know Twitter's going down the toilet nowadays. Oh, X. my God. Cl yeah. Twitter is just such a glorious dumpster fire right now. Yeah, so, I'm riding that plane all the way to the scene of the crash, and exactly. it is so, going to be. The first thing I wanted to say openly on this show is support Shay by buying his book, by following him on Instagram, sending him a message saying we support you, following him on YouTube. He wrote the book Frederick Nietzsche and the Left-Handed Path. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece of work by Atramentus Press. And don't let these arbitrary assholes dim the light that Shay represents, okay? 
Because next thing you know, if they're muzzling guys like him who aren't saying anything controversial, it's not like he was going on Facebook saying, oh, sacrifice babies and drink their blood. No. He wasn't making any noise. He wasn't doing anything. They just hacked him for no reason. It can easily happen to the nicest of us, to the ugliest of us, to the richest of us. If this continues, then we're going to lose some good authors. We're going to lo- People are going to feel that their message and their truths are being violated. So I am asking every single one of you out there who watch and follow Magic.TV to support our brother, Shea Belay. Because you know, it might just go back to the the old days before social media. Yep. When uh, back in my day, <laughs> uh, back in my day, the internet was called books. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, no, but 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 seriously, I'm you know, it may may have to go back to private platforms where people have their own web page mm-hmm. and they're doing their own videos and putting them up on the web page. You know, and let me see and if I you can, can interact with them there. Because he's got a lot of good content on YouTube, but I don't know if he has an actual YouTube page. Um, but if he does, I'd also ask you guys to follow him. Um, because, like I said, all the stuff that he talks about is just gold. Yeah, he does have a YouTube page. And it's actually the same thing. It's also on YouTube, Shea Belay. Um, he hates it when I... It's the same thing, at Shea Belay. Uh, it looks like it says Shea Bile. He'll hate you for saying that. That's my joke to him. <laughs> You're just hating this guy with the last name Bile, but no, he's he's, he's I think he's uh he's an Irishman with the last name Belay. So let's support him. Let's get his book if you haven't gotten your hands on it, because by supporting him, we are not allowing his light to be dimmed. And by buying yeah. his book and keeping this author alive to fight another day, I do know he has another book coming up with I think Haiti and Press, and I'm already lined up to purchase that. All right, so. This is a travesty. Our brother does not deserve to go through this, and I will continue to support him. And if he wants to get featured on this show for season four, I'll gladly put him there again. Right, Wade? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, we had a we had a good time last time he was here. Yeah, amazing fella, amazing fella. Now, some good news. Congratulations to our friends in Anathema Publishing Limited who actually hit the 100% goal for their publishing of Semeselam and the reprint of EAO. Congratulations, Gabriel, and to um, Mr. Sabugal for such an amazing art book that's going to be coming out. It's going to, I mean, I'm going to get my hands on my EIO copy soon. More power to uh, to Anathema Press for just being the tip of the sword when it comes to quality occult education and bringing new names into the limelight. I mean, it's exactly what we need nowadays. Now, another thing to keep in mind, though, is that... Um, Aside from that, tonight we don't really have a guest, but you and I are going to be talking about something that I think people are going to want to hear. But let me just do a little bit more populating. I just wanted to ask while I'm going on, why do you think they did this to Shea? Why do you think that they... Uh, I pop- have no idea. I, I have no idea what why they do anything anymore. It's Half of it is so automated uh-huh. that they'll come through and they'll scan for keywords. And they'll be like, oh, well, he said this, he said this, he said this. So it's like three repetitions of a particular word that they've been told to trigger, and they will just flush the site waiting on this. So you know, like if you can, if there's a method for appeal, you can go back and say, hey, I want an actual human being to look at this. And they come on there, and then they're like, oh, well, yeah, okay, we made a mistake. But half of these things are automated, and there's no way to tell what algorithm they're using. So, it, it, honestly, there's no way to... I can't even guess. what a, The only thing I can think of is that he said a word or had something that looked like it could be interpreted a particular way, and the uh, the AI bots just canned it rather than take a chance. From what I know, he did make an appeal. And they wouldn't even give him a reason as to why they deplatformed him, which I think is the biggest form of donkey shit in the world. All right. If they're going to remove somebody from one of their forms of livelihood and their platforms for expressing themselves, the very least they're deserved is a reason why they're not being removed, not being platformed. And he wasn't given it. So this is me saying, hey, Zuckerberg, get your shit together. Um, you're not a fascist social network platform. And there's really nothing you guys can do to stop him. Because he can always go to YouTube. He can always go to make his own page. He can go to so many different platforms, and he will be heard. You will not yeah, say I mean, 
But yeah, Facebook's kind of old and busted now anyway. Exactly. So it's not like not like there aren't other options out there. Now, another thing to watch out for, like I said, check him out on... I don't think he has anything on YouTube. Uh, I think he has a website, though. Is it Deferred Gnosis? No, it's not Deferred Gnosis. I think... I don't think that's his page, but just check him out on, on Instagram. Say you heard about what happened to him on magic.tv and you're here to support him because we're going to support him all the way. Now, with the other good news, also with Anathema Press, we're pulling out something from the old library, brother. It was my Christmas present to you, to my hetero life partner. None other since today we're talking about the Grimoric edition. Yeah, baby. Where's yours? The Grimoire Encyclopedia. Holy yeah. shit, man. Okay. Yeah. When you were into this way before I was, so it was such an honor to give you one for Christmas. What did you think about this masterpiece? Oh, you know, honestly, I started Grimoire work when I was, oh my God. I was a wee tot. I was maybe 13 or 14. When I got my first copy of the Lamegaton, it was this... It's really it's strange. It was a really small leather bound green book, mm -hmm. and it had the um, the Adonai um, Laman on the front mm -hmm. where God had horns, yeah, which didn't appear anywhere in the book. It was actually from the greater key, but I had this particular edition, and it was all in this neat Germanic black letter font, or at least the incantations were. I really wish I still had a copy of it. It was very pretty. But, uh, yeah, if I had had something like this, I mean, if you if you wanted to look up any particular critter that you've got, you've got all the things, all these tables, tells you exactly what they do, uh, what book to find them in. It's, it's insane. This is an exhaustive catalog. You know what this is? This is Tobin's spirit guide from Ghostbusters. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But you know what's even worse it, about it? It's not just the spirit guide. It's also the spirit manual. Because everything you need to communicate with the spirits is in here. Like, let's say you wanted to do work with the god Anubis. You could literally just look up the god Anubis, and it's going to tell you which books he's present in, which occult text he's there. And then it's going to tell you, oh, example, he's in the... Uh, um, PGM, for example, then it's going to show you the kind of things you need to work with him, what tools, what incense. It is just the future of Grimoire Magic. That if you are practicing Grimoire Magic and you don't have a copy of the Grimoire Encyclopedia by David Rankin, you're just, it's like writing letters in an email age, right, bro? Well, yeah. I mean, th it's, th it's, this is. This is exactly what I figured that Tobin's spirit god would be like, you know, back in 84 when Ghostbusters came out. It's like, oh, you mean he's just got like one book with all the things in it, you know, and we're just going to flip to X and look up Zool. And there he is, you know, and, and and you'd have all of the all of the information on how to, you know, wh who he is, what he does, all these other things, how to work with him. This is just an amazing collection of work. And you know, it, it's it's like decades worth of work to save you from having to do decades worth of work. You know, you, suppose you find something, you know, living in your basement or whatever. You something contacts you and gives you a name. You can look the name up. Mm -hmm. And even the means of what's necessary in order for you to to summon them. But the only thing I'll say about this is, it is good for the practicing magician. However. It is not good for um, those who want to start from zero because there, this book actually tends to assume that you have a basic understanding of magic to some level. So, oh, yeah. This is not entry level. Yes. This is not for the – Yeah, this is not for – oh, interesting. What? In volume two, um, I had forgotten about this part. It's got all of your different um, – all your different spell components all laid out and what you can, what they're for and what book you're working with. Like, you know, the blood of a monkey. In case you ever wanted to know what to do with the blood of a monkey. Um, it's all in there. Not only that, it also even has the incense recipes. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. 
And you remember back in the old days, to get the knowledge that's in these two con- these two condensed books, you would literally have to bury yourself in dozens of books to piecemeal everything from all the other books. Right. Oh, shit. You know, I want to work with Anubis, but, you know, he's in PGM and he's here and oh, I need this incense, but this incense is there. And you're just basically going to be drowned. This yeah. makes Grimoire magic infinitely so much easier. So this is a gem. David Rankin, if you hear us, please join Magic.TV. We want to have you for season four. Hello, Maite. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Um, but, you know, going back to it, too, there's only one complaint I have about this book. And you know what that is? Tell me, there's no volume three? No, where's the fucking app? Uh, don't you think, waka waka, right? <laughs> don't you think that if this came out as an app? Oh my God. Future of magic, man. The well, I, then, yeah. then you're going to make it too easy to use, and then you're going to start getting your acolytes and magelings in there, and they're, oh, I've got the app. I downloaded the app. I paid my $1.99, and um, I'm off to work with some demons, and this thing will actually recite the incantation for me, and, and then you're going to have trouble. Yeah, well, that's but true, but I think that... I support other- trouble. That's the greatest way to learn. Because, like, you know, the closest thing I had to this was, because, like, I've been studying the PGM with none other than our, our, our beloved Jack Grail, and... Um, the PGM by Betts, the PGM by Betts is a very understandable text, but what I like is what Stephen Skinner did with it when it called, uh, he had his own version of the PGM, but it's not really the PGM, it's the secrets of Greco, uh, uh, Egyptian magic, and he actually synthesized it more and chunked it up more, and Stephen Skinner is really good at doing that. He'll take obscure texts, and he will scholarly organize it so that you can appreciate it better. So that was my first foray in this. It wasn't until this came out that I was like, now this is how you do it. This is a wizard's handbook. That if you're doing Grimoire magic of any kind, if you don't, I don't care if it's Goetia, I don't care if it's the the Almadel, I don't care if it's the Book of Oberon. If you don't have this, you're writing handwritten letters in a day, in an age of email. All right, Heather yeah. has a big comment to share with us. Facebook keeps erasing my posts with no explanation and making it seem like phishing or likes or nonsense. They don't even specify which post. They don't even explain why. There's no procedure to comment with Facebook. We can lodge an appeal with multiple choice reasons, but one knows not when they deleted it nor which post. This is another level of crazy making us discomforted off balance. I know not why, but precisely I couldn't be a hazard and educated guess. Now I get it. So basically she's saying that they're full of shit. And I kind of agree with her. All right. Yeah. So with that being said, shout out to David Rankin. Can you please hold up your copy wave for the for the episode? Come join us. We want to have you, David. You got a really good book here. And once again, shout out to our brother Shea Belay, who we feel should be Platform immediately. Replatform immediately. Yeah, that, that's strange. They don't even. They didn't even send him like an acknowledgement of it. They didn't even give him a warning. Yeah. Well, usually they they give you a notification if they say, "Oh, yeah, you know, something you did, you know, we're 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 bouncing your account or we're freezing your account or you're suspended or whatever." They're, they usually at least notify you, even if they don't give you a reason. And you know what, what pissed me off even more? They didn't just kill his fan page. They killed his personal page. But not his Instagram. Not his Instagram. That's the weird thing. So for now, show your support by following him on, on Instagram on, and on YouTube. And, of course, the biggest way you can show support to Shay is to buy his book, Frederick Nietzsche and the Left Hand Path, especially for you Left Hand yeah. Path. It's a really good book to have to your collection. Somebody should put up another fan page. Yeah, that's something we can do, and I'll ask him if he wants to do that, but I'm willing to bet he's pretty pissed off, so I'm going to let it see the bit. Yeah. No. Now, before we go on to the main topic uh, of actual um, solidarity with Shale, I actually like that. Solidarity with Shale. I'll take that. <laughs> All right. So before we actually talk about the topic of um, Grimoire Magic for today, I also want to give props to probably one of my favorite teachers I've had in the past 10 years, the ever so illustrious Jack Grail, who is opening level two of the PGM 
PGM The Kingdom. Dude, his PGM course, level one, was so fucking amazing. It offered me a brand new way of appreciating learning magic. Because, you know, in back in our days, we'd sit with a jug of coffee or a bunch of energy drinks and a shit ton of books, and we would drill it into our head. Jack's got this amazing way of teaching magic that makes it digestible, fun, and it's not even chewy. It's like practically ground up for you. It's like practically the ground beef of magic. It's burger already. So it's just pure flavor. And the best thing was, we just finished um, BGM1. Everybody was saying their goodbyes. It's been a good year. And, you know, during my depressiveness, I would look forward to these classes every Sunday. It's like, oh, wait, a new lesson with Jack. And, you know, we have the interaction yeah. with him. It was just somewhere to belong. So right after the class, everybody was like, oh, God, this is the last class. I said, no, it's not the end. Jack, please come out with a part two. And I was like, I asked all the classmates, how many of you here want part two? Jack, I, I will rally everyone. Please make a part two. Well, April 8th, PGM2 is coming out. So for those of you who have taken PGM1 and you want to jump to even heavier stuff, PGM2 with Jack Grail coming out April 8th at the Blackthorn School. So check them out. I'm excited for that. That's already my birthday gift to myself. Paid for it. I'm enrolled. Looking forward to it, brother. So let's get to the topic at hand. Boom. The Grimoire tradition. Why? Why do we do this? Why do it? Wow. You know, honestly, it, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need magic at all. If Because if everything just operated like clockwork, like it's supposed to, if all the gears were in the right places, we wouldn't need to do any of this stuff. But we're the engineers now. Because whoever's been in charge of this place for the past 12,000 years is clearly expecting us to sort of take over. So we're having to kind of put all the nuts and bolts together. So when you start looking at like, well, what are we doing with, you know, Goetic Magic? The, regardless of what model you use uh, to explain the, the existence of spirits, they definitely exist. There's things out there that are conscious. They're aware of us. They will communicate with us. Even, even if people say, oh, it's just parts of the human mind. Well, shit, everything's parts of the human mind. You know, there's nothing that you see or hear that doesn't come to you through your brain hole. So when you start working with these spirits, you're actually getting an interactive um, grasp on your environment. Instead of people saying, well, I, I talk to the trees, I talk to the birds, I talk to the, you know, the, the wind, water, and sun... Well, yeah, but do they talk back? Do you, are you getting any feedback from your magic? You know, it, does someone come and say, hey, you know, we hit, a, we hit a snag on this. This other person's got something else going on and you were mistaken in your initial assumptions. Well, hell, that's the best part of this is that you can actually call them up and get feedback on what you're doing. So, yeah, it's great. It's interactive. Um, there is kind of the danger of getting into the personalities of them because, again, it, I don't really... Uh, subscribe to a lot of the major models of spirit um, biology, I guess it would be. So y you can't really start saying, oh, this is my friend. This is my, my new friend. He's my buddy. I love him. That starts becoming problematic because you start investing too much of yourself into something that may or may not. I don't know. I've seen a lot of things. In the world, you know, I've seen angels and demons. I've seen gods face to face. I've seen UFOs. I don't believe in any of them because mm -hmm. belief becomes its own problem. That's just my point of view. Uh, I know things exist. I don't have an explanation for them. I don't like the idea of believing in something that I can't really get a handle on yet. Well, I do have a question for you. Why not just hedge magic? Why not just candles? Why not just spells? Why would one, I mean, I know the answer again, but I want to share this to the viewers. Why well, go nope. through all the trouble of getting the tools, the fasting, all that stuff? What's the point? Why not just throw a bunch of magic missiles? Why go through all the heaviness of it? Well, I, uh, again, it, it, it comes back to the idea of feedback. Mm -hmm. You cast a spell at something, it goes and you're waiting for results. Was that, you know, is that, that would be like an arrow. You fire your arrow. 
you're waiting to see if, if you know you hear it hit the target whereas with uh you know you're working with you know goetic spirits or whatever that's more like a guided missile you're getting feedback the entire time and it, it'll tell you exactly what's going on when you can expect results what you could do next or it'll come back and say like, yeah, man, he, uh, he's got something around his house. He bounced me off like a bad penny and you come back again. So the whole idea of having these is, is having someone to talk to, to talk you through it because you get feedback. Well, so in other words, it's not just something blind. It's really something that's like, um, getting, getting some sort of communicative side to it. It's like a bullet. Exactly. You, am I correct? Exactly. You're getting feedback. You're getting the the touch response. So like you know, when your your phone vibrates when you touch a key, even if you don't see it do anything, you know it's been, you know, the message has been received because you're getting feedback. All right. We just uploaded also the link here to PGM practices two uh, the, with the Blackthorn School. But then again, if you haven't taken part one, you don't need to take part two and one in order to take part two but i wouldn't tell you to miss part one that's like jumping straight into empire strikes back without watching a new hope you know so you're not going to get the same <laughs> level of appreciation for it and once again for those of you just tuning in we want to say congratulations to our friends at anathema publishing limited for so far hitting the goal that they had for their kickstarter for um mr zabogal's work i forget his full name at times but um, Sebi Salam and Iao will be reprinted. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Congratulations, Gabriel, for a job well done. And, of course, we were talking earlier about um, the muzzling of our dear friend Shea Belay. And I'm liking this statement that people are saying, um, solidarity with Shea. I'm going to make that the hashtag for all of the publicities we do on that. So, like, okay, going back to the, the, the whole Grimoire tradition. All right. Is this something that newcomers should follow by the book or can they piecemeal it? Um, you mean newcomers to spirits or new, newcomers to magic? Newcomers to the Grimoric tradition. Like, okay, you oh. know how to practice magic, but I want to get into the Grimoric traditions. Yeah. Do I need to follow everything or can I just say, oh, well, I'll do this, but I don't need to do that? What's your take? Well, I would recommend, first of all, stick with the book mm -hmm. with the methods in the book at first mm -hmm. but especially with um with say the the lamegaton for example mm -hmm. you have you know the the book of evil spirits the book of uh mixture of good and evil spirits <clears throat> i would work with ones that are more but now the the book of evil spirits isn't necessarily they're not all evil mm -hmm. but they, they, I would stick with the ones that have a good disposition because it, it says in there which ones are. Um, the ones that are for uh, benevolent purposes, you know, like for healing or communication or giving new knowledge, those are good ones to start with. But what would you um, say would be the bare minimums that a person would need to have in order to practice the Grimoire tradition? Because, like, from my point of view, if you could be skilled enough to have enough astral gift to scry and see the spirits that's already one step in the right direction now some people would say well i can have a scryer but if you yourself have that ability to perceive spirits and know how to scry that's a very useful tool in doing the grimoire tradition what do you feel about that well the bare minimum the first time i summoned something um I, I didn't even really have a proper circle. Uh -huh. I had a, um, a moldy old graduation gown that I had borrowed from somebody, <clears throat> just black robe. Mm -hmm. I did a circle with salt and a chant that I had picked up somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I did I did copy the the conjuration directly out of the book. I used uh -huh. the conjuration straight out of the book, um, which brings up like another idea there when the cell yeah, in the name of you know Berlinensis and baldy and all of these names of power that you don't know yeah i strongly recommend not using words of power that you don't know true if you have to use any uh any particular names um use your own not your own name but like your own gods whatever gods you believe in 
um, use those because Good. the whole point of Barbara's names of evocation is that they mean something to you. Even on a subconscious level, it, it, if you just have the names out of the book, exactly. eh, you're kind of taking a risk. Yeah, like, I'll give you a good example is this. I kind of adhere to what Lon Milo Duquette says, that um, in the practice of ceremonial magic or even the grimoire tradition, a lot of the times, not all the times, but a lot of the times you recommend a triangle, right? And in the standard triangle, you have the name Mikael, you have an axithon, an faxithon, pneumathon on it. But he said something very important. It's better to put names in the triangle that are in adherence to your beliefs than some weird fucking names that don't mean anything yeah. to you. Because if that triangle said Jim, Jack, and Jill, that doesn't do shit for me. But if that triangle said Belial, Hecate, Anubis, all of a sudden, that's an adherence yeah. to me. So from my own, my own perspective on grimoire tradition is, especially if you're going to be doing the summoning of spirits, the bare minimum you would need would be the triangle and the circle. Are you in agreement with this or disagree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And for the conjuration, mm -hmm. the um, the use of your own magical name is kind of like you're laying out your resume. Uh -huh. So say if you have, you know how your magical name evolves as you kind of go through the thing? If you would come up there and you'd be like, you know, I am, I am, you know, Ari and I have, you know, forged the the fivefold star and the or the sixfold star and the flaming star together in the forge of my soul. I am Magach Shalil and I have, you know, drunk of the cup of the Sangrail. You have all of these these names that you've used to commemorate specific magical milestones in your career. And when you come up there and you're addressing this guy and you're just like, "Do you know who I am, bitch?" You will obey me because I am this, I am this, I am this. I've done my things. I've parted the veil. I've, you know, crossed the abyss. I've spoken, you know, uh, the word of the aeon. And, you know, come to the window because I have a job for you. Th these are things that you would actually, these are the names of power that you should be using. Mm -hmm. Is... And the, the further along you go in your career, the more of these names you're going to collect until it's going to be, you know, 20 minutes of you introducing yourself. Um, but even if you just start out, if, if you're saying, okay, I have my, you know, my, my first magical name and I've only done a dedication, I don't, I don't really have an initiation yet. Even if you're coming out there and you're just saying, look, I'm so-and-so, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I've done so far. I need you to come out because I have a job for you because it's your job to work with me on this. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's just, you know, I'm an ego Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. You're introducing yourself. You're giving some background and you're laying out some expectations. That's a proper introduction. Yeah. There's one thing I want to ask you, though. OK, so we agreed that the bare minimum would be the triangle and the circle. But I was curious, what would happen if some douchebag, idiot, young occultist decided to say, I don't need a circle, I don't need a triangle, and they decided to try to call up Belial without those things involved. Would they burst into flames, or would he just ignore them? What would you think? Um, well, they're tools. The, I actually had one of them sit down and explain the purpose of the triangle, and he's sitting there, and it's actually it was actually kind of a funny um, episode because he was... He's all in this Renaissance outfit, and he's explaining, like, he's laying down all this heavy, you know, four-dimensional stuff on, on exactly how the triangle works. The triangle is a focus. Mm -hmm. It's a container the same way a cathode ray tube is a container for a TV show. Uh -huh. it, it brings it from the point out into a focus where it can be seen. So it's really only there to help you and give you a focus point for it and it you know it contains it it's sort of like the box where it happens yeah but you can do it without it the first time i did it i did it without it and what i was seeing was um in the room we had candles up and so you could see like you know flickering shadows and all that but then we just saw one thing sort of drifting across the wall a shadow of something that wasn't there and i was just like Ah, shit. We're in a circle and he's running around loose. What do we do now? 
<laughs> so we ended up having to stick him into a crystal before we um, opened the circle again. Well, here's but one that, that was because you do need a container or something, a focus for them to manifest in. Yeah, that's exactly why I don't do goetic rites here at home because I got a dog and I noticed that one time I was doing a goetic working in my living room and she was running around and kept them going around the circle. And I don't know, was it coincidence, but right afterwards she got caught with distemper and she started having seizures. So since then I was like, you know what? I don't want to lose my dog. I'm just going to do all of my goetic workings at the office at the Mysterium Center instead. Now here's the next thing I wanted to ask you though. How do you know you're ready for the goetic tradition? What and like when do you cross the line between just looking up 1,000 spells and going as far as trying to get spirits to communicate with you through the Goetic tradition and we're through the through the Grimoire tradition? So, how do you know you're ready for that level of magic? Well, from one point of view, we're never ready mm -hmm. for that because it's sort of like jumping into the pool, you can't just dip a toe into this, you can't be like, Well. I'm going to see a small spirit because even the smallest ones, you're still kind of taking that leap. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, from the other point of view, we were born ready. This is our birthright. These things belong to us. They're part of the natural order. So somewhere in between always and never, I guess it depends on how you look at it in terms of actually doing it though. I would recommend at least being comfortable with ritual magic. Yeah. And so from your point of view, what are some of the basic rituals you think that a, a, a maid should know in order to at least attempt these things? Well, the LBRP is always good for kind of softening the world around you and sort of, yep. you know, bright, drawing a line. So that, that's your basic. That's your go to. Uh, I would recommend learning how to scry. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Some people are naturals. Um, I I always thought scrying was just the easiest thing in the world because it came natural to me. And uh, I got a lot of grief about that because uh, I don't even remember his name. And the guy that plays Bloody Mary with the black mirror stares at his own face until it turns into something else, which I personally think is ridiculous, but that there it is. I, is the, that more uh, it's what? Isn't that poker and yun? I don't know. I don't remember. All I remember is that when we came out with the Lamegaton, he showed up and said that I plagiarized it from him, and I'm just like, bitch, you didn't write the Lamegaton. Whatever. Okay, which brings I, me to I got it from the British Library, so unless he was King Charles, um, this isn't his book. But brings but me to the, the next the, one. Yeah, if well, the, the point was that I was always able to see them, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not really the best... Um, uh, the best advice on that, but I, I would definitely recommend being able to see them before. That's like saying, well, okay, make sure you have good audio equipment before you start doing music. That just makes sense. It does. Because then you can see them, you can hear them, you can get some feedback from them, and then start calling them. So if you have to pick up any particular skill, I would pick up scrying. Scrying and banishing is a good combination. I mean, it's it's really... Um, now, here's one thing I was going to ask before I get to the next big question. A lot of people say that in the practice of Grimoire Magic, you should memorize the conjurations. What's your feel on that? Uh, yeah, in a perfect world, it should be recited, you know, from memory, not necessarily read off a book, because you can really, it's the same reason that you memorize your lines for a play. Uh -huh. Because when you know the lines, you can actually deliver the lines. If you're just reading it out of a book, you are just, please show your support of our beloved friend, Shea Belay, and follow him on IG. As opposed to coming out and saying, please show your support for our friend. You see, you see the difference. You, you can really put some, you know, rub some funk on it, as they say. When you, when you, if you have it, if you have it memorized, you can really punch it out there. But um, my, the, you know, my first time, uh, my first few times doing it, I didn't have it memorized. All right, it's so one of those things like it, it adds spell points to it. 
you've heard me talk about spell points before, like having the right incense, right number of candles, right color of candles, robes, blah, 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 sword, tools, all that stuff. Everything adds juice to it. Mm-hmm. So having it memorized, that's going to add some juice to it. Make it more powerful. Now, a lot of a lot of people would also like to ask me, but Rob, where do I start? Where would be a good grimoire for me to begin with? I have my personal take, but I want to hear yours. Um, honestly, I uh, I did start with the Lemegaton, and it worked out for me with the the Book of Goetia. Mm-hmm. I just picked ones that I that seemed less threatening. Ones that they say, oh, yeah, this guy is a good disposition. He's uh, number three. I don't like saying their names unless I'm actually working with them. But, like, you know, number three uh, was always one of my uh, my favorites still to this day. Uh, he, he's got the um, – he's one that he'll, – he'll give you information. He'll, if you're looking for a particular piece of information or knowledge or hidden, hidden data, um, he's the guy to go to, and he's never let me down. It's just, he's he's Basil Exposition. If you're like, hey, I need to know about this. It's, oh, here's what's going on. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, at some point I want to go over, we can go over like the making of spirit masks. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to do was have a whole, a whole episode of just a class of making a spirit mask. And I'll have them in different stages of construction. Um, a, a dummy mask. I'm not going to make like an actual mask for it, but... Um, walking people through exactly how to do it and what it does and um, it'll be the fun stuff like because like not everybody's got the guts you see to just jump straight into the Goetia and deal with demons some people are actually afraid of it Um, my own take I got two books that I actually toyed around with when I started practicing evocation Um, first was Franz Barden's The Practice of Magical Evocation a lot of people of the Bardonic tradition say that you got to master initiation to hermetics before even considering that um, but a lot of people say that, you know, that's the ideal, but that's not the norm. If you're going to focus 40 years of your life to get to step eight in initiation to hermetics, uh, you won't even have much left to actually get into evocation. What I like about it is that if you read it, he gives a very, very intricate handout as to how spirits should are, are, are arranged according to planets. So it's a lot of planetary spirits, elemental spirits. And like what you need to do to prepare for an actual evocation. I really love that. But my personal favorite for beginners that once you have a good understanding of evocation is the Grimoire Armadale, the Olympic spirits, because they actually respond very well. And there's a lot of good text out there that can help you expand your understanding of how the Olympic spirits work. So that's if you if you really want to try a little bit something more intermediate, the Grimoire Armadale is a good one. Now, for those of you who have no understanding at all of how to work with spirits, then getting into the Grimoric tradition not, might not really work for you. It really, because a lot of it has certain overlaps, like the fasting, the chastity, the the prayer after of, before donning the robes. I mean, a lot of these things are like borderline religious, but they have overlaps, and it's very intricate. And all it does, it just they stack. So, okay, I did fast, and it is the day of the spirit, and I did make the sigil of the spirit, his corresponding metal, and I have his corresponding incense. Basically, your magic is just stacking, and Mm -hmm. some people don't want it that intricate. Some people are like, ah, too much work for me, and if you're you're that kind of person, then maybe you'd be better off in, like, chaos magic, but if (laughs) you're the kind of person that sees that these stacks make your magic more powerful, then yes, the Grimoire tradition is right up your alley. See, that's what I liked about um, the difference, because I've, I've done ceremonial magic. I've also done, like, pagan magic, you know, with Gardnerians and Alexandrians. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that, say, with Gardnerians, they have um, the, the high priestess is kind of the one doing the magic, and everyone else is just sort of batteries, where they're, they're doing the dancing part, and they're building the energy, and then the high priest just kind of directs it all in. It's sort of like throwing a bucket of paint against a wall. Yeah, You get the wall painted, but I always wanted to have that um, combine the two techniques. Because with ceremonial magic, all the details, all the stuff that goes into it, you're focusing your energy like a laser. 
And I'm thinking if you could have all of these people generating energy that one person is focusing, you could do anything in the world. When um, uh, I used to drum with Yalcor, it was a band mm -hmm. in the Bay Area back in the 90s. Back in the 90s? <laughs> back in the late 1900s. <laughs> Think about that. Damn. So um, we would go to, we would do shows and April would be, at one point, April would come out in the middle of the, uh, like, to the front of the stage or in the middle of the audience and start doing her ritual with everybody dancing and the band playing and all of this. And it was always, always just insanely powerful. Because mm -hmm. you'd have, like, 300 people dancing and just pumping energy into this room. And one person taking all of it and focusing on it. Oh, it was great. It was really something. Yeah, especially the fact that you're just raising the energy. You could actually use that for evocations. You could use that for spells. I mean, imagine all of that you know, set in one direction, the impact. Oh, yeah. Now, here's the other thing I wanted to ask you, though. Like, a lot of people say uh, in the Grimoric traditions that, oh, aside from the Goetia, because, of course, a lot of people, that's the most popular, but are there other Grimoire, um, grimoires that you would say, hey, give this one a try. I mean, like, oh, check out, example, the Sword of Moses, or check out the Ar the Ar Arbatel. I mean, like, anything aside from the Goetia that's close to your heart? Um, You know, some of the other books of the Lamegaton, I like the Third Goetia. It was the Third Goetia with the um, the Wandering Princes. Mm -hmm. um, I had summoned all of those mm. the one night, and um, well, the interesting thing was I... I basically extracted the oath from all the wandering princes because uh but they knew me already under a different name which i found to be interesting i don't know what the deal is with that but uh the the scryer said that yeah each one of them came up and was just like oh you again and so i, th I thought that was interesting but i i've always liked working with them mm -hmm. they're of a pretty decent disposition and if you have anything that you need, because they're they're basically gin. Yeah. Um, they will go and carry messages, get information, uh, do things for you. So those I, I you know I liked working with them too. The, the I've read a lot of the other grimoires, but none of them really seem to have a compelling enough um, compelling enough operations in them. That weren't already somewhere in the Lamegaton. So, from your point of view, the Lamegaton is kind of like a one-stop shop, right? It's it's kind of a one-stop shop. It's got everything in it, and I would love to do since the books of the Lamegaton are a um, they're kind of well, yeah, you know, like the they're they're versions, they're magical versions of other books like the Steganographia and mm -hmm. a lot of the the Pauline art. A lot of these things are converted for the Lamegaton, but I would I would like to actually go through and kind of re remaster each book off of the original that it was made from. And that would be something. That would be like a a that would be a complete Lamegaton. That's true because you if you notice a lot just everything all the attention when it comes to the Lamegaton goes to the Goetia. They don't really talk about the Ars Pauline or the Arsturgia. And I think these are aspects of the Lamegaton that deserve equal amount of airtime. Well, it was the only one that was published as a standalone book. Mm. Everybody does the, the Goetia because it's the book of evil spirits. Mm -hmm. And it was the main book. It had like all of your, you know, your conjurations, all of your temple stuff. But the fifth book on there that um, they said was the Artem Novum. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was actually the Crowley had said that it was supposed, or the, the, I guess the original thing was that it was supposedly the meanings of the names that are around the circle and in the triangle, but they're not. They're actually part of. They're the rituals that you're supposed to perform while you're drawing the names around the circle. So that's really sort of your um, your setup ritual in in the fifth book. So the fifth book is basically your power ups to give juice to the actual temple. You're yeah, creating. it's how it's the rituals of constructing your temple when you're drawing the circle and the triangle, that you're you do these rituals while you're um, writing the names in there. Are there any grimoires that you just had zero interest in going near? That like, oh fuck no, 
not even going to touch this. Ah, uh, well, without going too far into it, because we could do several shows on the Necronomicon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, don't, don't, Donna. We're going to do something special but, on that. <laughs> yeah, but just to touch on it. Now, there's the Simon Necronomicon that I've actually met the author. Uh, when you look through the book, you can see that if you, you, you could see Crowley's ritual formulas in this. So, yeah, it's not an ancient Sumerian book of magic, but you can see how it works, what it does. And if you go through and you take the names that are capitalized and you run the numerology on them, you can mm -hmm. see it comes up. Oh, yeah. You know, 666, 418, 93. I see where these numbers are going. I can see kind of this whole ritual formula. That that becomes a whole different thing when you're doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But then there's been a couple other attempts by other authors to write their own Necronomicon. And one uh, some of them were like the, the fiction authors from the Cthulhu Mythos, and they put it up and it's just pure fantasy. That's one thing. There's other authors that have tried to make it something like that, but some of the stuff that they that they're doing is at best useless. But I'm I'm looking through and I'm kind of piecing together the ritual formulas in these, and they range from useless to ridiculous to outright dangerous. I do have so one I, I want to ask you before you do. One popular ritual aside from the Lamegaton that made a lot of noise was the Grand Grimoire and the Red Dragon. So what's your take on those two? Uh, I've never worked with either one, personally. Um, a lot of them seem to be more about making uh, sketchy deals with them. Uh, it, it, it just didn't seem to be something that I was interested in at least interested enough to work with. Uh, I can give them another look at some point, but it's it's been a while since I revisited the other uh, grimoires. But yeah, that would be something that we can cover on a, on a whole other show to really kind of open that up yeah, and look at them. Look forward to in season four. But pretty much that wraps up tonight's episode. Once again, tonight, this, the hashtag is Solidarity with Shay. Let's support our dear friend, Shea Belay. Um, Absolutely. Really, really against his deplatforming, and we hope that Farce Book gets its head out of its ass and actually allows him the platform he deserves to speak his truth. Also, congratulations to Jack Grail for coming out with the PGM2. Looking forward to that. And, of course, the successful Kickstarter of Anathema Publishing Limited's um, Semeselam and EAO. Congratulations to them. Anathema is the tip, tip of the spear when it comes to quality occult books. So for tonight's episode of Magic.TV Presents, this is Rob signing out. Wade, you're an officer and a gentleman. I'll see you soon. All right, my friend? All right. Enjoy your evening.